Um, so once again, thank you for being around, for staying with us. Uh, we're going to keep talking in the same direction as before. Um, so this time is like Rust integration with C++. I have the pleasure to introduce like Olivier. I already got a sneak peek on this talk in Berlin and I was like, it blew my mind. So I hope it's going to be the same here. Uh, so a round of applause and let's start. Hello. Um, so I'm Olivier Goffin. Um, so I started uh, open source with KDE and that, as a student, and then that led, led me to be hired by, by Nokia to work on Qt, Qt as we call it. And then since 2011, I work for my own company. Uh, we do consultancy around, mostly around Qt. Um, so I don't know how familiar everybody here is with Qt because it's not really Rust, right? We're in the Rust room, but Qt is a C++ framework for mainly for UI, amongst other things. And um, so this is a typically so this is uh, uh, some C++ code, but um, it's it's a Qt object, and um, as you can see in red, there are those those macros. They define some um, some extensions to to C++ in a way. So they are going to be read by, by a tool which will extract the properties, extract the signals, ex extract the slots, and put some metadata around the code so then it can be called uh, by another feature of Qt, another uh, feature, it's, it's QML. And so, um, so this, is, this is basically QML is, is describing user interfaces in, a, in some funny languages based on JavaScript. And um, here we have a, the model is basically a C++ object. And when we query, uh, we can pr query properties from the C++ object, and we can call function from the C++ object, from JavaScript, from this QML which embeds JavaScript. And so if I go back to the, pr to the previous slide, um, so here the, we have set status class, uh, uh, set status text, which is going to be implemented in, in C++. Um, and the QML can call this because of the annotation we have and because the mock has uh, extracted all the properties and we can uh, call C++. So that's, that's, a, that's a strength of QML, which is an easy way to represent user interface, and when we need performance, we can use C++. Um, so in, when I was working for, for Nokia, I was one of my... One of the things I did was to work on, on QObject and making signal slots and mock working. And when I left, I still, I still was involved in the Qt community and I did a few, a few things. For example, uh, MockNG is to be, so the, the real mock, so the, the tools that parses the Qt, the, the header uh, that you write. Um, the real mock is written by a handmade parser, and I thought maybe it can be better to use a uh, libclang for that. So that's one of my side projects. Another uh, side project is Verdigris. So it's a C++ header library, which um, with macros and template meta programming, can we generate all this metadata at compile time uh, with funny, funny macros? Yes, we can. So that's, uh, that's one of my projects. And then, because I like making meta objects, so the Qt meta object is this, those metadata. Um, I thought maybe can we do that from Rust directly? And so that's why I came here. <laughs> Eventually, one thing led to another, and, I, and I'm presenting this. Um, but I was not the first trying to to um, call to use Qt from Rust. Uh, there was uh, many. Pre uh, there was several previous attempts at making Qt bindings for Rust. For, um, as far back as 2014, somebody tried to write a tool called uh, C CXX to Rust, and he wrote this blog post trying to to explain what his his tool was doing. And the title was "The Pains The Pains of Wrapping C++ in Rust" on the example of Qt5. The the conclusion of of his his research was that creating a, automatically bindings from Rust to C++ doesn't work very well. There is too many, 
so I, I, I took this, uh, the, this image from uh, this uh, square into the circle, which I myself stole from Yas, uh, from another tool. Uh, but so there's too many concepts like overload, default parameters. Um, how do you map that in, in Rust? Or the fact that in C++ you do not have lifetime, so when you have pointers, or, which some, sometimes you're lucky, you have smart pointer, but um, how do you map that to Rust, which needs to, to know about all of that? So you cannot take a C++ API and create all of that a, a, a Rust API, a, a idiomatic Rust API safe. Um, that's just not possible. Um, but it's not possible to make it automatically, but st still you can do it. Uh, so the, the manual way, which is um, how one will do it uh, manually, is to write for every, every time we want to call into C++, we write in C++ a C function, well, uh, an extend C function in C++, uh, which calls the C++, uh, which calls the C++ API we want, but so we expose basically a C API for every of the functions we want to call. And so we only can use pointers and, and types that the FFI can understand. So no, 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 no stand, standard strings, for example, because it's the, there's a constructor and destructor, so that, that wouldn't work. And on the Rust side, we need to add to, to write this uh, extern function. Uh, with the same name, we don't forget the nom angle here, and then uh, the types there need to match the Rust equivalent. So some of the things we can automate, for example, creating this, when, once we have created, created those extend C function, we can uh, auto, uh, automatically create those disk, the, uh, disk end. So there is this tool, it's called the bind gen, and it can automatically create those extend functions from, uh, from a header file. Um, but so this, this works for C, but only for a small, small subset of C++. So you cannot, for example, have virtual functions. Or, and even then, it's still not idiomatic. Rust, so it's still a lot of manual work to, to create an idiomatic Rust API to wrap your, your C++ API. Um, another project, um, this is the Rust Qt binding generator. It's from uh, Jos van der Hover, who is here in the audience. So um, uh, this, is, um, this is a project also which is hosted in KDE. And um, what you have to do here to, to use it is to create a JSON file. And in, in your JSON file, you describe basically your objects and all your functions and the parameters that they're taking. And so first you write this, this JSON files, and then this there is a tool that generates uh, C++ and, and Rust codes that then you can use from both uh, C++ and Rust. So in the end, you still need to write a minimum of uh, C++ code to call this to call this uh, into the Qt API. And, uh, and this is this is a a good tool. But what I wanted to do really is to create is uh, that you have really idiomatic uh, Rust code that you do not need to write any C++. You do not need to know anything about about C++. Um, so I didn't want to to write manually all my code to. Uh, on my extern C function, and I found this crate, Rust CPP, uh, whom I then later contributed to. And so um, there is two parts. There is a uh, there is a, a CPP crate, which is the runtime crate, and there is also a CPP build crate, which is a build dependency. So you need to have a build.rs script. Um, and so this allows basically to include C++ code directly into your Rust code. So you are in an unsafe context, of course, because it's still C++. But you can, so here, 
this thing you know, this thing would be is C++ code which is included into your Rust function. Um, you also need to have a, a build.rs, uh, so, uh, so that's this is what Cargo runs, compiles and runs at compile time before actually compiling your host code, it will run this little script. And so this little simple script will tell, um, will, what, what will it do? It will pass the file, um, your, all your Rust code, it will extract all the CPP and CPP class macro which are in your Rust code, and it will create a CPP file with all this, um, all this C++ code in a, CP, in a C++ file, which will then be compiled with a C++ compiler by the CC create. So this is doing automatically what, uh, so this is basically creating your external function which you would have to write manually, but you write them in line in your, in your Rust code, so you don't need to change context from, from one file to the other when you, when you touch um, C++ file. And then, at runtime, there is the, the CPP create, which will just uh, create the calls that calls into those functions. Um, and uh, so there is, a, there is a procedural macro for that. It's a custom derive. Uh, it's behind the scenes, so you don't see that. Um, but uh, this generate code that also checks that the size and the and the alignment of everything you pass to C++ is correct. Um, so this is, a, this is an example for, for uh, the QImage class. So QImage is a, so you have a QImage class in C++, and we have here this macro, C++ class. And this is gonna, this is gonna declare a, a, a Q, a struct Q image in Rust, which represent a Q image in C++. And this macro will also use a procedural macro to declare a drop trait, so that when, when the, the, the struct in Rust is destroyed, it calls the C++ the structure of the image. The clone trait, so when you copy the image, it implements the, it, it calls the, the C++ construct, uh, copy constructor on copy, and so this allows, and, and also it creates the struct of the same size of a, of a QMH, so such that when, such that, that um, basically is, is just exposing QMH um, from C++ into Rust. And then you need to add some API around it, so you need to, you can implement a, you you're create an implementation for QMH, and then you have a manually created, created uh, idiomatic Rust API for QMH. So, and in every function, you use the C++ uh, macro, which basically will allow to to run C++ code. So, basically, just to forward your C++ function. In C, uh, in C++. Um, and so, as we can see, we can, so this looks a bit like a capture, and that's basically what it is. So you can pass some local parameter to the C++, and QString has been exposed the same way. So there is also a C++ class for, for QString. So you can have QString in Rust, and they're mapped exactly to QString in C++. Um, and so we can do the same with, uh, with every function. We can do a very small wrapper around this, those functions with a, a Rust sounding name in a safe API and um, with, uh, with Rust types and stuff like that. Um, another feature is when we have um, virtual uh, or, or uh, classes that you should inherit in C++. So there is no, what, what the, the closest thing to inheritance in C++ is re-implementing traits. So 
in this case, normally in C++, you would inherit from the Q abstract list model list model class in, 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 in C, and you want to expose a trait. Um, you want to expose a trait that that does the same. So you're going to create a, a trait and call it Q abstract list model. So it's a trait which has a few functions. Um, and from the from the C++ code, uh, you're going to override the virtual function in in in. So all of this all, the, all of this code in C++ only. It's because it's wrapped it's wrapped in a C++ macro. So all of all of this code is in C, is C++. And when you re-implement um, your class in C++, you will call then into Rust using the Rust macro. So you can have a Rust macro inside C++ macro to call Rust from C++. And so you override the, the data function of Q abstract item model. And you can, from the, you can then call the data function of your trait object. And so this trait object is basically a wrapper around two pointers, the vtable and the, and the pointer to the object. So it's a, it's a very simple. It's, it's just mean that, well, this is opaque for C++, but when we pass it, when we pass Rust object to the Rust macro, we tell the type system that this is basically a, a reference to a Q abstract list model. It's a, 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 a trait object. And so this allows basically to create. Um, so this, so this thing you would write in in your uh, in your bindings, of course, and and so the user of of the binding it just re-implements the Q abstract list, list model trait and do not have to care about all of that. And that's how we we map inheritance to to Rust. Um, though, so this using using this C plus plus crates, it's enough to create the Q meta object RS um, uh, create, which wraps basically the most basic cute classes. So we can we can use uh, the most basic cute API that we need from Rust. And in addition, there is a which was actually the reason why I did this is uh, there is a a custom derive, so it's a procedural macro for a Q object uh, trait, um, and this this procedural macro will generate the meta object at compile time. And so, I didn't know much Rust at the time, so I implemented that using some some macro in the type. But maybe this should be attribute in a future versions. And so I have those those macros that looks a bit like the cute macros and that basically is annotating the code saying so name name is a property it it inherits from from q object in this case and we have a few a few methods and then we can register this type so i i was uh, creating here the struct greeter then we can register this type to the cute uh, runtime engine, and we can just load an QML files. And so this QML file is, uh, so again, it's, it's JavaScript, it's the same as before, and uh, here we call basically a Rust function from the JavaScript. And that's basically, um, yes, so, that, so that's basically the goal, uh, to have easy user interface from Rust using QML in a safe way. So there, there, there is still a lot, a lot to do, and um, I'm not sure that everything is really safe. So, um, well, it should, I mean, there are, there, there are, there are points where uh, there, are, there are always corner cases which are indeed bugs, um, but I, I would like eventually that uh, Everything, when it says safe, you, it's really safe. Um, but um, so, in conclusion, what we've seen is that um, we've seen that creating, if you want to to wrap QML 
or if you uh, sorry, if you want to wrap uh, C++ from Rust, there is always some manual work that is going to be that you're go you're going to have to do because um, you cannot just translate a header file and make a Rust API out of, out of that. So there is always going to be manual work, and it, and the goal then is to make this manual work as easy as, as possible. And in this case, I believe the C++ crate is the way to go because the C++ crate just you still have to write unsafe, but you can just put the C++ code where, where you call it, so you don't have to change context, change from file to file. To file. And so we've seen how to, how to um, call C++ from Rust. And I presented the, the Q, Q meta object uh, create, which allows to call, uh, to use QML and to expose your Rust object to QML. So if there is any question, I'll be happy to answer them. Yes. So, the question is, um, if I understand correctly, that when you when Qt API returns a pointer, it's not always obvious if who has the ownership of this pointer, even for the developers. And it's true that Qt was written. Uh, most of the API is a bit uh, dated and was before smart pointers and that kind of things. Uh, so yes, you need to read to read the documentation to to find out. But it's the job basically of the bindings. Uh, the, uh, the people who are writing the bindings, that they should read the doc, they should find out uh, who has the ownership, and then they should put the, the, proper, uh, the proper annotations on uh, the proper lifetime on those, on those, uh, result, on those results. So uh, when, when you have a, uh, when, so when a, a, you call a function that returns a pointer, uh, you're going to wrap it into some kind of box or anything, and depending, uh, yeah, depending on on what's the what's the real meaning of this function, it so the, the yeah. So when you write the when you write the binding, you should know about it, and then you can add the the, the right lifetime or put it into the, the right uh, containers or, or smart pointer. Um, yeah. So there's another question there. Um, yes, so the question was if if it's required to put no mangled um, so um, so, um, so in the, the c plus plus so this this c plus plus cpp macro you do not have to to do that because basically it's the macro itself who ha who has this no mangle so the so as a, as a user of the C CPP macro, you don't have to, to use uh, no mangle. Um, if I go back a few, a few slides. Um, so here, basically, what the, this, this thing here will be put in an extend C function, which will have some names. And then this macro will, Will call the right function with the right no mangle. You don't have to take you, you, you as the as the developer using this macro. You don't have to take care about no mangle. Um, 